Welcome to another edition of, I was about to say, the Sheffy Sandbox. I forgot there for a moment that I have renamed it simply to the Sandbox. So thank you for joining me for another play date in the Sandbox. Today's podcast is again sponsored by me. This time I would like to highlight my tarot and oracle and I Ching offering over at aprilific.com forward slash tarot <laughs> or what you can do is simply go to dragonrosetarot.com so yep let's get into today's episode I wanted to catch you guys up on how it's going with the artist way course we just finished week three and when I say we I'm talking about the cohort that Mindy Fetzer started she's facilitating this 12-week course. One of the things that I've talked about is that the author says from the very beginning that you need to have a once a week artist date, basically a solo date where you go and do something that inspires you or that you think is fun. I released a TikTok over the weekend about how my artist dates have gone so far. There have been three of them. But in case you are not on TikTok, I will go ahead and give you the, the lowdown. Week one, I took myself out to see a movie. Week two, a massage. And then the third week, which was on Saturday, I took myself to see another movie. Now, each of those events left a little something to be desired, but... I am committed to staying the course and doing the solo dates for the remainder of the, of the course. And what I think I've been learning is reflected in how I entitled the TikTok, which was the proof is not always in the pudding. <laughs> so let me explain. If you were to look at just the outcome, objectively what happened and subjectively my feelings about it, then it could be said that they were failures in ways. But one of the things of value that I have found in it is in the process. Not necessarily what I had to show for it, but in the process of making the time for myself. In the case of the movies, I got to pick what movie I wanted to see, I got to pick where I wanted to sit, whether or not I wanted candy or other concessions. It was just really, really freeing in a way. Like, wow, I have this time. What am I going to do with it? Even though the movies themselves I wasn't particularly impressed with or thrilled with completely, just making myself a priority felt good because I definitely had the temptation to make it a family event. There were definitely some shoulds. And like someone commented on the TikTok, the motto or mantra, I will not should on myself for others. is like definitely something that I want to, to take on for myself. So I had been telling myself, I should make this into a family event, et cetera. But no, I mean, I, I did it all by myself, even though it might seem very selfish. And that process of looking inward to see what I want, how I want to do it, I think I, I'm starting to see why it's so fundamental in the Artist Way program. So I probably will continue to do it even after the course is, is finished. But yeah, the massage was kind of great in the moment, but the masseuse was working on my shoulder and I don't know, it, it just really hurt afterwards. I was in pain. <laughs> so I'm interested in how the remaining artist states will go and just telling myself that the value is in the process and not just in what I can show for it, subjectively how I 
experienced it. I made myself a list today so I can kind of keep on track. Oh yeah, okay. So week three had a lot to do with anger. Now I remember my family and I, we had a short stay at a crisis center and part of that they have counselors that come in and basically tell you over and over again, this is not your fault. This is not your fault. So like, okay, I get it. But one of the things I remember at that time, I must have been around 10 or 11. I had this huge disagreement with the counselor at the time about whether or not anger was okay, whether or not it was biblically sound to be angry. She contended that it indeed it was. She had Bible verses to back it up. And then I thought I had Bible to back it up. <laughs> so, but now, what, 30 years later, I'm, I'm starting to see what she was talking about. It's never too late to learn. What I wanted to do is I wanted to tell you some things, read you some quotes from this week, week three about anger that were amazing. I mean, it starts off so powerful. Anger is fuel. We feel it and we want to do something. Hit someone, break something, throw a fit, smash a fist into the wall, tell those bastards. But we are nice people. And what we do with our anger is stuff it, deny it, bury it, block it, hide it, lie about it, medicate it, muffle it, ignore it. We do everything but listen to it. Anger is meant to be listened to. Anger is a voice, a shout, a plea, a demand. Anger is meant to be respected. Why? And here's the mic drop moment. Because anger is a map. Anger shows us what our boundaries are. Anger shows us where we want to go. It lets us see where we've been and lets us know when we haven't liked it. Anger points the way, not just the finger. In the recovery of a blocked artist, anger is a sign of help. Here's another one. Anger is the firestorm that signals the death of our old life. Anger is the fuel that propels us into our new one. Anger is a tool, not a master. Anger is meant to be tapped into and drawn upon. Used properly, anger is useful. And I have this paragraph starred. Sloth, apathy, and despair are the enemy. Anger is not. Anger is our friend. Not a nice friend, not a gentle friend but a very, very loyal friend. Here's the part I have underlined. It will always tell us when we have been betrayed. It will always tell us when we have betrayed ourselves. It will always tell us that it is time to act in our own best interest. Anger is not the action itself. It is action's invitation. Action's invitation. I love it. Let me see if there's anything else I have underlined that I wanted to mention. Yes. So it talks about anger. It talks about shame. Those of us who get bogged down by fear before action are usually being sabotaged by an older enemy, shame. Shame is a controlling device. Shaming someone is an attempt to prevent the person from behaving in a way that embarrasses us. Let's skip forward a little bit. It says, before a wound can heal, it must be seen. And then I thought this part, this paragraph later on was interesting. Many artists begin a piece of work, get well along in it, and then find, as they near completion, that the work seems mysteriously drained of merit. It's no longer worth the trouble. To therapists, this surge of sudden disinterest, it doesn't matter is a routine coping device employed to deny pain and ward off vulnerability. All right, so last week we talked about denying pain and warding off vulnerability, right? So I thought that was really cool that, 
that plays into that. By telling our shame secrets around our art and telling them through our art, we release ourselves and others from darkness. This release is not always welcomed. Okay, so I love this quote by Anne Boskamp. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing her name. Shame dies when stories are told in safe places. I want to say that again. Shame dies when stories are told in safe places. Another quote I underline is, taking in the first doubt is like picking up the first drink for an alcoholic. That <laughs> word picture really resonated with me because I may have touched on this before, but I have a rather addictive personality. <laughs> and so I find it so much easier to just not drink at all than to somehow lie to myself and tell myself that I'll just be responsible and have one drink. So yeah, putting that into perspective of doubt was so helpful because just like I wouldn't pick up that first drink, I am not going to allow myself to pick up that first doubt and question myself. Another quote here from the week three chapter is practice being kind to yourself in small concrete ways. Look at your refrigerator. Are you feeding yourself nicely? Do you have socks? An extra set of sheets? What about a new house plant? A thermos for the long drive to work. Allow yourself to pitch out some of your old ragged clothes. You don't have to keep everything. Okay, I think this is going to be the last quote from the chapter today. Acquire the habit of checking in with yourself. Several times a day, just take a beat and ask yourself how you are feeling. Listen to your answer and respond kindly. If you are doing something very hard, promise yourself a break and a treat afterward. Yes, I am asking you to baby yourself. We believe that to be artists, we must be tough, cynical, and intellectually chilly. Leave that to the critics. As a creative being, you will be more productive when coaxed than when bullied. Okay, there is so much here. Oh, and I lied. I completely lied. There was a really important thing here about growth. It was saying growth is an erratic forward movement. Two steps forward, one step back. Remember that and be very gentle with yourself. On my treasure map for this past year, which I think I'm just going to tweak a few things and keep it for this current astrological year because it just seems still so relevant. I have gentle repeated on there several times. Gentle is my word. A creative recovery is a healing process. You are capable of great things on Tuesday, but on Wednesday you may slide backward. This is normal. Growth occurs in spurts. You will lie dormant sometimes. Do not be discouraged. Think of it as resting. Okay, so maybe that, that that makes the end of the quotes I'm sharing from this week. But there's so much there. There's so much there. Anger being a map. Anger being our friend. Not a gentle friend. Not a kind friend. But a very, what does it say, loyal friend. It tells us where we've been betrayed and where we've betrayed ourselves. And what we've experienced that we don't like and that we don't want to repeat. And that anger is a fuel. It's not the action, but it, it points the way. It is the action's invitation to do something different. I loved that. I wondered what a healthy relationship with anger would look like. As an Enneagram one, I know I'm getting the verbiage wrong, but the default emotion of the body types is anger. Anyway, I feel as though that has been really true. In my life, one of the things that I feel first 
is anger, but the whole time thinking that anger was wrong, I just tapped that down, told myself I shouldn't be feeling this. Anger is a sign that there's something wrong with me. <laughs> And that if I were only more evolved, more Christ-like, then I either, I wouldn't feel anger, which there's a lot of nuance, right? The Bible does talk about Jesus overturning the change makers tables in the temple, but also talks about turning the other cheek. And I think sometimes we focus on just the one aspect and think that that's what anger looks like is not letting ourselves really acting on it. And the book says here is not meant to be acted out. It is meant to be acted upon. I wonder this whole time if I had not thought that anger was wrong, but it is a very natural emotion. And it just tells me where my boundaries are, what's important to me, what I don't want to happen again, then that makes it so much more normal and acceptable and doesn't pathologize myself, right? Which brings me to another point. In week four, one of the challenges is that we have to go through what they call a reading deprivation. But if you translate it out into today's terms, you can change that into a media deprivation where you're taking away all of these outside influences, all of this outside talk where it's being directed at you. And you just create this space and this silence to be able to hear yourself. So what I decided I was going to do is at least for this week, a podcast deprivation. I'm not going to listen to podcasts. That for me is really, it's quite a bit of a sacrifice because I have about an hour plus commute to work every day. And I listen to podcasts about really meaningful things to me, you know, self-development, psychology, astrology, things that really feed me. But at the same time, that is outside information, someone else's words and creativity being spoken. And I just need to create that space. I haven't read chapter, I haven't read the stuff on week four, but I just know that that is something that starts today is where we have to create a week of deprivation. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be creating that space for silence and to see what my my own mind has to tell me what I'm wanting to hear myself say and give the microphone to different parts of me and maybe hear things that I didn't know I needed or wanted or was thinking about I say all that to say that there was a podcast that was recommended yesterday that I'm not going to have a chance to listen to for a while. But just from the short little tidbit I got to read, it was talking about how we have this tendency to put, to view everything through a psychological lens. And as such, sometimes we can miss the point and pathologize things that are actually quite normal and don't need to be pathologized, maybe don't need the misnomer of healing because they're very natural ways of evolving and growing. I could be completely <laughs> taking it the wrong way, but that's what I got from it so far. And I, I thought it was really cool because it ties into Mars entrance into Cancer. Now, Friday, Adam at, over at Nightlight Astrology, he does a daily podcast and YouTube channel. And Friday's episode was about Mars into Cancer, Trouble the Waters. 
And one of the things that he said that Mars in Cancer can signify with Mars being the planet of war and Cancer being a water sign, it could be very literally speaking like a, a Navy ship. So I thought it was really interesting because that came out Friday and it was talking about Mars entrances into Cancer, which would happen Saturday. Well, Sunday morning, I woke up from a dream all about this Navy ship. <laughs> I wish I had looked this up before starting to record, but you have this theme that Star Trek has touched on several times about a parallel reality in which the good Star Trek crew meets their evil, <laughs> evil twins in this parallel reality. Well, that's what happened in my dream, except one was not good and one wasn't bad. However, there was this team that were below the surface of the deck. And I'm going to get all of my Navy terminology wrong, but they were below deck and they were the ones that were actually keeping everything running and on course. And in dream terminology, it's below the surface. So it would be your subconscious and it's directing this boat in the water, water being emotions, this team in the subconscious, they're the ones that are actually navigating emotions. What happened though, is that this one woman's parallel character that was not used to or familiar with the Navy, she had a matching hubris to her her under deck counterpart and decided that she was going to fix everything and her counterpart down below gleefully destroyed her what I took from that when I woke up is that my mind my intellectual capacities they may from this psychological lens that's as a society we've pathologized things. I may come in and think I know the answer and just jump in and have this hubris that I know best and I know what's what when I really don't. And this counterpart that's in the subconscious will gleefully just destroy that intellectual piece that thinks it, it knows everything about how to navigate the emotions. So short story, I want to take more of an approach where it's not a top down, because we all hate that, right? Top down approach is awful. No matter where you work, if you don't feel seen, heard, acknowledged and you're having to implement these policies that are set in motion by people who don't have the boots on the ground, so to speak, it really breeds resentment and anger. <laughs> so I want to, instead of having this hubris that the mind can fix everything, I want to rather do it from a round table approach, have everyone speak. I want to have my body say what's happening. I want to have my emotions be able to have their say. And then I also want to have my mind be able to put in its two cents as well. And then kind of come together with this game plan after having checked in with everybody, so to speak a move forward from there, as opposed to sabotaging <laughs> myself, the emotional part, be like, oh yeah, you think you know what's best? I'm going to show you and have this blow up, explosive moment where you have to realize that I really had no clue what I was doing. 
So I think that was really fascinating though, the timing of the dream. And I know that having heard that, that in itself could have planted the seed for the dream, but in my, in my experience, it still feels like a really beautiful synchronicity and guys, synchronicity was brought up in week three. And you know that I think synchronicity is the universe's love language. And I love it. And once you start to see it, you begin to see it everywhere. And it's so awesome. I think how a lot of people experience it to begin with is they'll start to see repeating numbers. And they'll be like, what's up with this? Every time I look at the clock, it's a mirror number, 212. Or you're looking at it and it's always 1010 or 1001. And that's an opportunity. You can either dismiss it as nothing or you can start to be like, ah, that's interesting. And just start tracking it and hold space for the possibility of it being something, but without investing too heavily in it. And you will find that the more you observe and witness that the more the synchronicities will happen. So I have a daily planner and what it ended up being more than anything else was just a synchronicity journal. At first, all I had on there were time. Every time I looked at the clock and I saw a number that seemed meaningful, I would write it down. Maybe it was 222 or 333 and 444 all in one day. I would write that down. And then as the time progressed, I realized that there were synchronicities happening in something that had occurred in my awareness. And then it'd be followed up with a podcast I heard the very next day this word that's not used very often would come up in my meditation. And then the same word would come up in a podcast the next day. And it's like, oh, so you just kind of track that word or that podcast. And then you start seeing themes reoccurring in different podcasts or books you read or conversations you have. It's really, really fun. So what else? We talked about anger, reading deprivation, artist dates. We talked about Mars and the cancer. Last day, I want to talk about jealousy. And I've talked about this before, but I recently saw a social media post that phrased it really well. So I'll link that below. But jealousy, just like anger, is such a gift. It's showing you what you want and why are you why are you putting yourself outside of that circle why are you putting yourself on the outside looking in as though they have something you don't this can provide you fuel, just like anger. Jealousy is the fuel to help you realize what it is that you really desire, where you may be holding yourself back, and where the inner critic in yourself is trying to keep you small and or telling you you are not this thing or can, and cannot become this thing that you admire. So jealousy can tell you what you admire and it can be the fuel to see exactly what parts of that you want to integrate in yourself and what type of language are you using that limits your capability of achieving that thing. All right, so my friend Courtney Starkey, she sent a newsletter talking about a new session of hypnosis that she's offering for high achieving, I think it's called high achieving hypnosis, but it's for people who actually want to kind of fast track their progress and 
do something. Sometimes we have these awesome experiences and then we're like, oh, that was fun or that was cool to think about, but we don't actually do anything. And the progress that you make can be somewhat limited, proportionate to the amount of action you take on the, the helpful tips that you get during hypnosis. This struck me, like I said last week, that not everyone is the same. I was listening to this podcast about Enneagram Ones. I don't know how many of my sentences start off that, that way. I heard this podcast. Anyway, I did. I heard this podcast and it's all about the Enneagram. And it was talking about what the different Enneagram numbers can do, what they can do to improve. And when they got to number one, I was like, okay, I'm ready. What else are they going to put on my to-do list? They said for number ones, they are the only ones that you need to tell them to do less. <laughs> I just felt so relieved. <sighs> So I'm thinking her high achieving sessions are helpful on several different levels. This email served to remind me that we are not all Enneagram ones. And so some of us do need to hear the ones who aren't Enneagram ones that we do need to hear action words. You need to do more. You can't just let it be a nice idea or a nice thought and sit with it forever until it dies. You need to actually pick it up like the football. It's a live ball. You need to pick that up and run with it. And, and then also, I was like, well, rephrasing. Sometimes doing more, that actually entails doing less. For example, I'm going through this podcast deprivation where it's not a look on the outside that I'm actually doing less, but it's translating into more. And I'm sure that she would agree that doing more and being a high achiever doesn't necessarily look the same for everybody. And sometimes that doing more could look like doing less. I don't know. <laughs> I can't speak for her, but I know she is a huge proponent of listening to your own spirit team and taking action on that. So if my high achieving looks like taking a break and resting, then just like in the artist way where it talks about growth is messy and it's erratic and it could be a step forward and then a step back, I'm going to allow myself that permission to have some messy growth, I think by leaning into that, that is going to allow me to become a high achiever. I hesitate to use that. Here's my process with that. I grew up where the only thing that I seemed to do well was in school, I made good grades, but I had no friends. I, I was not popular. I just knew that I seemed to test well in school. And that ended up becoming what I leaned into for my sense of accomplishment. In some people's books, that is being successful. That is being a high achiever, making good grades. Whereas I think a lot of people realize that success and high achievement is actually a much more well-rounded approach than simply getting good grades. Here's the thing. I often felt that my value was in what I could achieve. So when I hear people celebrating or championing, championing, high achievement, I just have to remember 
that they're not that voice in my head saying I'm not doing enough. They are just encouraging you to lean into whatever it is that that excites you, that's your purpose. And throwing off the things that are comfortable, but weighing you down, that are awful and heavy, but we know them. It is a familiar discomfort. And that is sometimes less scary. Okay, now that I'm saying this, week three talks about that too in this book, how often the unknown, we say we want something, but that unknown is often so much more scary than the discomfort that we're familiar with in the moment. So regardless of what high achievement and success looks like for you, you have tons of resources and people who are celebrating that and want to equip you to, to reach that, to reach into the scary but exciting possibilities and say, what the heck? <laughs> And do those things that get you to that, that point where the anger or the jealousy are pointing you to. What is it going to take to get you to this thing you want? And making the commitment to yourself to make those happen. Not to prove to anybody else. So I think to me sometimes... That's the shadow or the baggage that I bring to the word high achievement. And that's why I'm having to talk it through with you guys today is, is why the, that phrase kind of felt a little triggering is that I'm not having to prove myself to anybody else. I am trying to come to a place of integrity within myself where I am enthusiastically reaching and striving to make my dreams come true. I think so many times it's easier for us to give that pep talk to other people, whether that's our spouse or our kid. You can do anything you want, but how true do we actually believe that is for ourselves, for ourselves? And so what I imagine that her hypnosis sessions are is basically stripping away the excuses that we have wrapped ourselves in, seeing what are actionable steps that our anger and jealousy are pointing us towards that we want for ourselves. And I, I've said this before, when you heal, you're not just healing yourself, you're healing the world, you're healing for those who are witnessing you, because you are giving them the fucking permission that they need, or have been looking for, to pursue that for themselves, the pursuit of happiness. Last week I said I was going to try to get through an episode without getting emotional, but I think as a kid, there were so many times I felt insignificant that I felt like I needed to achieve success and external accolades. But then when those weren't realized or it was so much more difficult or things just didn't work out, so I thought if I had just tried, then my effort would be rewarded when, I don't know, sometimes that hasn't been my case. <laughs> that hasn't been true for all situations that I've experienced. And it's taking those setbacks and asking myself, okay, was it something that was a deficit within me or is it just life? 
And that reminds me as I say it, that one of the quotes I have in my book, so I wrote Sandra, a healing reimagining of the babysitter from hell. And at the beginning of every chapter, there's a quote and I forget at the moment what it's called, like an epigraph, I think perhaps. And it's a quote from a Star Trek episode that begins off each chapter. Okay, it is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not a weakness, that is life. Yeah, the thing is though, if we never try, we never know. And I don't know about you, but I think I would rather have tried than live with the what ifs or if only. So I would rather have tried and gotten messy and made mistakes and said, you know, I did, I tried. So that's my encouragement to you is to try and stay true to your own dreams and passions and take those tiny baby steps consistently. Sometimes they're baby steps and sometimes they're huge steps, but just take those steps consistently forward to honor yourself but without becoming attached to the outcome. Because sometimes there are setbacks, sometimes there are disappointments, and that's not a reflection on you. You should have tried better. There's something wrong with you. But, I, but likewise, whenever you do make those first steps, you will be so surprised about what synchronicities can happen, and that was talked about, like I said, in week three, about how you make one step forward, and the universe, God, it rushes at you and <laughs> makes up the, the distance, because it's been waiting for you to, to honor yourself and reclaim, reclaim yourself. So I think sometimes, so much of the time we've We've lost ourselves. And this is just the process of reclaiming our childlike curiosity and play and sense of wholeness. For some reason, it was important to me, it kept coming up. I need to look up the etymology of the word health and heal. Well, I did it this morning, and it comes from a word that means to make whole. So rather than pathologize ourselves rather than attaching value to the end result instead of to the process we are going to enjoy the heck out of this journey of reclaiming ourselves and getting to know that inner artist that inner child artist that needs protection and encouragement and a sense of fearlessness um Almost, yeah. Because when you're a kid, you don't know that things aren't possible. And sometimes that audacity to believe that something's possible, it can actually happen if, if you make steps towards honoring that, that inner child, that part of you. So I think that's it for today. I hope this has been helpful. I'm sure I'll have even more insights after reading week four because it's entitled Recovering a Sense of Integrity. One of the exercises last week, one of the tasks in the book is you write down five people you admire, five people you secretly admire, and then look at the traits that those people have. And that will kind of tell you what traits that you want to cultivate within yourself. But I realized after writing down my list is that the thing that I want to cultivate more in myself is an ability to speak my truth in such a way that both sees the humor, humor in a situation and does not back down. And that doesn't mean that I would be unteachable, far from it. 
but it's just that I feel as though my voice, my opinion, my core values, they matter as much as someone else's because from the way I grew up, I always felt it was my responsibility to damage control for the people in my life. These people who were not necessarily stable or emotionally healthy and secure. I felt as though I was responsible for how they felt. And I never wanted to say anything that would set them off. I never wanted to say anything that would make them sad or set them into a depressive episode or an angry outburst, whatever it was. And so I would take something that I felt, including anger, or my own personal desires and tap it down and read the room and conform to the person that would make for no confrontation. Confrontation is something that I, <laughs> I can't, I do not like. I do not like confrontation at all. Which some people might be surprised at because I think I do come across as a very opinionated person. But when I'm, that's me like right now, just expressing myself. But if I'm in conversation with somebody else, it's really difficult for me knowing how they feel to say how I feel because I don't want to be ostracized. I don't want to be othered. I don't want to be put into this camp of being ignorant or less than or disgusting or whatever it is. I want them to think well of me. And so it's always trying to pander to what they want me to be. What I was finding in these people that I admire is that they are who they are. And if someone doesn't agree with them, then they respectfully listen but they don't back down from their own, uh, their own perspective. Again, they, they remain teachable, but they're able to hold their own, which I think is so beautiful. And I admire that. I find that to be sexy and attractive in someone when they are able to hold their own and who doesn't back down from confrontation. They don't seek it out. Far from it, because that would be, <laughs> again, me with my confrontation, that would scare the heck out of me to be around someone consistently that did that, sought out conflict and confrontation. However, I think it is so attractive when someone is confronted by someone else's anger or whatever and remains calm in the face of it and doesn't backpedal to try and make the other person feel comfortable. So I think there is a way of bringing in humor because I think in some ways humor is so universal and also helps us not to take ourselves in the situation so seriously. So humor, I think can be a great tool in standing one's own ground, but being polite, respectful, allowing someone to hold a different perspective than yours, but yet respecting your own voice. That's what I saw from my list that I really like. And I want to cultivate more of that in myself. So here's wishing me the best. <laughs> All right, now I truly think that that's probably it for today. I would love for you to tell me your thoughts on this podcast episode, what rang true for you, what resonated, go to aprillithic.com and in the corner you'll see a microphone. Click on that and you can leave me a voice message that I can showcase on the podcast. So yeah, I'm just looking at this little card off to the side. One of the tasks was there were several different mantras and we needed to write down three of them that resonated with the strongest with us and put them in different places. So the one statement I'm looking at right now says, I am willing to be of service through my creativity. I think so many times I have hesitated 
to be creative, to put my voice out there in fear of, for fear of doing harm. But this is just the reassurance that my creativity serves mankind. And yes, I hope that this has been of service to you. And I'm sending you lots of love.